Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to worship with Cimarron Valley Church. Today's message comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 12 through 17, entitled, The Mystery of the Temple. We now join Pastor Paul Dawson. God's amazing grace. <clears throat> it was all because of a hill called Mount Calvary. You see, God, from the beginning of time, knew about the cross. <clears throat> he knew that he would send his son. He knew that you and I would be in need of a savior. Instead of pronouncing judgment upon us and instead of giving us what we truly deserve for our sins and evil and darkness and wicked ways, in his great compassionate love and mercy, God gave us salvation through his amazing grace, through his son, Jesus. What an absolute miracle. People say, I've never seen a miracle. I'm going to tell you, God's amazing grace brought a miracle to my life and to the life of many people that I know. God is a miracle-working God. He washed us clean from our sins. Today I want to share with you the mystery of the temple. I find it in the 21st chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, verse number 12. You can also find it in Mark 11 and in Luke's Gospel, chapter 14 as well. But Matthew gives us a clear understanding of what took place that eventful day when Jesus walked into the temple for the last time. You see, at the beginning of the ministry of Christ in John's Gospel, chapter 2, we read that this event took place, but it was a separate, a different event. At the beginning of the ministry of Christ, he went to Jerusalem, and he was appalled by the actions that he saw that were happening down at the temple. And so he walked through the temple and cleansed it at the beginning of his ministry. He declared even there that men had made the temple of God a den of robbers, but God had intended it to be a place for sinners to pray. For three years, Christ never went to Jerusalem because they sought his life there. But here in this passage of Scripture, he has made his way one final time to the city of Jerusalem, knowing what was going to happen by the end of that first Passover week. He knew exactly what was going to take place, and yet he went. No greater love hath any man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And even in our sins and in our darkness and in our wickedness and wicked ways, he counted us as his friends. That, my friend, is amazing grace. Verse 12, Matthew 21. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant and said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants? You have perfected praise. Then he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, and he lodged there. So 
So this was the time and beginning of the week of Passover. The triumphant entry had taken place the day before. In Mark's gospel, he gives us a, a little bit different witness or evidence of this story. He said that at the end of the day, that first Sunday that Jesus made the triumphant entry into Jerusalem, that at eventide, Jesus walked over to where the temple was and he saw all the happenings of the temple, all the things that were going on. Just to describe a little bit of the goings-on around that temple that day, he saw lambs and doves and sacrifices of animals being brought into the temple. As he stood there in the outer court, the court of the Gentiles, he saw the money changers sitting at their seats. The reason for the money changers is because you couldn't use the Roman coin or the Greek coin at that time, in order to buy or sell in the temple, you had to have it changed. History tells us that at the rate of 25% profit, the money changers would change the Roman coin into the coin that could be used to buy and sell within the temple walls and in the temple court. So money was being made hand over fist. History also records to us that many times the priest would declare a sacrifice unclean that someone had brought themselves. And so they were forced to buy one that the priest had declared clean there in that outer court. That outer court was a special place for the Gentile people. If we would have been living in that time, it was a special place for you and I that we could have come into, and we could have heard the word of God as it rang throughout the walls of that, that holy temple. We, we could have heard the message of God as it was delivered. We could have heard, if we'd have been there this week that we're speaking about today, we could have heard the words of Christ as they rang out and echoed throughout those stone walls of this magnificent structure that had been built for the worship of God. But not in the outer court in this moment in time. As Jesus stood there that Sunday evening and viewed all the happenings of the temple, everything that was going on was exactly opposite of what should have been happening in the temple. The next morning, in Matthew's gospel, we read that he came back to the temple, only now he came on business, on business for the kingdom of God. He returned to the temple the next morning. It was a Monday. He came to the temple first, not to the government, the seat of government or to the palace, but he came to the temple. He came to, to bring spirituality to the people that were there that day. He didn't come to overthrow the Roman government or to unseat Caesar. He came that the people of God and those that were seeking God, they might have a way to hear the truth of God. That was what he came for. He began this week of ministry by, number one, bringing holiness to the temple of God. The Passover had brought prophets to the money changes to the priest and to the sellers of livestock, all in the name of the temple. But Jesus had some unique words that he shared when he began to cleanse the temple. I see him now, even as his disciples stand back in astonishment and watch him as he herds up flocks and pushes them back out through the gate to clear the outer court. For those of us who've been around farm animals and that sort of thing, what it must have smelled like in the outer court, what it must have sounded like in the outer court, 
It was like an auctioneer. Have you ever been to a livestock sale and heard all the noises and smelled all the smells that go around that sort of thing? That's what it would have been like in the court of the Gentiles when Jesus walked in that morning. Everything but what should have been going on was going on. Men were making profits. Priests had been corrupted. Priests were, were putting hard things upon poor people. The Bible said that Jesus walked in and he began to clear this outer court. He began to clear a way for the Gentile to come into the temple and hear the word of the Lord. His words, he said, it is written as they stood in astonishment at what he was doing as he cleared that outer court. I don't know exactly how that may have gone. Some have different pictures of what happened. I can see Jesus as he walks by some surly guy that is making the money changers and just tips his table over and coins just fly across the rock floor. I could see that man stand and as if he's going to do something about it. But something stops him. I can see him as he pushes by the priest and herds the animals up and pushes them outside the gates of that outer court. As he clears this entire courtyard, he says these words, It is written. If anyone should know, what was written, it should have been the priest and the scribes that day. But Jesus had to remind them, it is written, my house is a holy house. It is a house of prayer. It is a sacred place where men and women and children find God. That was the purpose of the temple. It was, it was the theme of the temple. This is where people came to hear God's word spoken. This is where people came to find solace with God. And even the Gentile nations out in this outer court that the Jewish people weren't concerned about, as Jesus cleared that, he said, it is written, this house is a house of prayer. This is where men come to find God. But he said something else. You have made it a den of thieves. In our language, he was saying, you've made it a dwelling place or a hideout for thieves. Jesse James would have felt at home here. It's a den. It's a dwelling place. It's where vile, wicked men come to sell their wares and to oppress the poor by selling them doves at a much higher rate when doves could be caught by anyone. They were merely pigeons, turtle doves. But here, men were making a profit Christ come to bring holiness to the temple. That's why he cast all these out. So that people like you and I could still find God. The reason why Christ comes to this temple is to rid it of its wicked ways. What temple am I talking about? The church? That temple? that we read about in Matthew's gospel? No, th this temple, this tabernacle, this dwelling place that you and I have, it's called the, the temple of God. Paul wrote about it in the book of Corinthians. It's a mystery. But this temple, this shell of a body that you and I walk around in, the very presence of God wants to take up residence. We ask him into our lives, into our heart, into our very soul. See, we can't find holiness ourselves. We have tried and failed. 
Men through the years have tried to tell us and describe for us what holiness is, and it's only been failure. We've never known true holiness. Holiness is not in the way you dress. Holiness is something God brings into your life. Sanctification is a setting apart. Righteousness comes from Christ, not from us. For the writer said, our righteousness is as filthy rags. It's just not good enough. We work, we labor, we serve, and we feel like that's going to get us through. No, we need for Christ to walk through the temple, our temple, and bring holiness and righteousness into our lives. I've said this so many times throughout my time in ministry. I gave up trying to clean people up a long time ago. I found out I couldn't do it. But when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of a heart, I have watched as the righteousness of God takes over in that life. I've seen sin-hardened men out on construction sites who could tell dirty jokes like there was no tomorrow. They put a lot of comedians to shame. But I've seen when the Spirit of the Lord took up residence in their life, how something changed and righteousness and holiness reigned in their lives. I've seen men who were cold towards God, but once Christ came into their life, would stand in a church service with their wife and with their children and sing to the top of their lungs about the grace of Almighty God. I have seen holiness walk into the temple. And that's what happened that day. Christ came to bring holiness to the temple like Christ comes into our life to bring righteousness and holiness to us. The second thing I see here, in verse 14, Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. That seems just like a, a statement. No real value there. I mean, it's Jesus. We just learned earlier this morning, Jesus healed two blind men on the road to Jericho. It was like his second nature, that if he saw someone hurting, that someone needed healing, he just touched them and healing came. But there is something more to this statement, that Jesus not only brought holiness to the temple, but Jesus brought healing to the temple. You see, as you look back through the pages of the Old Testament, when David subdued the Jebusites in what we know as modern-day Jerusalem, it wasn't called Jerusalem, it was called Salem at that time. And David came against the Jebusites, and it, the city was so fortified that the Jebusite leaders stood on the wall before David and his army and they said, these great warriors of the Jebusites, why the lame and the blind could keep you out of here. That's how weak you are against our fortified city. And the scriptures tells us that David found a tunnel where the water came through the city, the river. And he had some men in the darkness of night that scurried through that water tunnel, found their way inside that city. And they were able to subdue the Jebusites and conquer that evil city of Salem. And David made it his own city, and it's called Jerusalem to this day. But in, in finishing the job there that day, David, in a, in a s s sort of making fun of the Jebusites, said, don't let the blind or the lame in. It, it was a 
a way of mocking them. But the priest, the priest, the scribes, had taken that little portion of what David said in a way of mocking the Jebusites and had said, the blind and the lame cannot come within the gates of the temple. It can't happen. Another place in the Old Testament, when God gave the Levitical priesthood under Aaron, God said a priest that's blind or lame will not be able to conduct the services of a priest. And so they had taken that scripture to mean that the blind and the lame could not come into the house of God. You may recall when Peter and John were on their way to prayer at 9 o'clock in the morning over in the city of Jerusalem in the book of Acts that there was a lame man that was sitting at the gate beautiful. That was one of the gates that led into the outer court of the temple. The reason why he was sitting there was to beg alms, of course, and begging money to suffice himself. But again, he was not allowed in the temple. That was the way the blind and the lame were treated by the all-knowing priests and scribes of the day. But when Jesus came into the temple, everyone was welcome. And the scripture said that the blind and the lame were healed. They were able to walk through the gates of the outer court. And when they did, Jesus in his healing power and authority brought healing to the house of God that day. My friend, this temple, this mysterious temple where Jesus said, it sh I shall be with you and I shall be in you. This place of residence, the temple that you and I possess, it is a place of healing. Not just physical healing. Christ came to heal us emotionally, mentally, physically. He came to bring his grace which is sufficient in all things. Even the apostle Paul when he suffered and he prayed fervently at least three, on three occasions and God said my grace is sufficient for your temple, Paul. Everything is going to be just and evidently Paul had received it because he said, in whatsoever state I am in, I have learned. Did you hear that? I have learned to be content. Jesus brought healing to the temple that day. Jesus ministered holiness and healing and finally Another thing happened in the temple that day that was unheard of as far as the priests were concerned. But when the chief priest and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, isn't that, isn't that alarming to us? They saw the wonderful things that he did, and yet they were critics. Don't be alarmed, folks, when people don't want to hear your story of the blessings of God in your life. There's a critics on every corner. You go ahead and tell your story. Here's what happened. And the children were crying out in the temple and they were saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Children were not allowed to speak in the temple area. They were to keep totally they weren't to say anything within the walls of the temple. But something must have ministered to them there that day in that outer court as Jesus spoke and the blind and the lame were healed. And the animals were all pushed aside and coins fell. No wonder the children cried out. I can see them down on hands and knees picking up coins. But they cried out, and they said something special. Hosanna to the son of David. They declared him as Messiah. The children even cried out. See, Jesus, when the disciples said, 
whoa, 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 little children, you, you don't need to bother the busy master. Jesus said, oh, no, 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 you let them come here. You let, because that's what the kingdom of God is made of. What was he talking about? The faith and innocence of a child. And here again, this last week, when Jesus is in the temple, for the first time in these little children's lives, they were able to cry out, and not be criticized or stopped as they brought honor to the temple of God. God desires our worship and praise. God desires that we have a song on our heart for what he has done in our lives. When they said Hosanna to the son of David, they were declaring that Jesus is the Messiah. The adults couldn't do it, but the children could. It was like the angels had touched the hearts and minds and voices of these little children as they cried out the truth of God before the whole world inside of this temple. I can hear it now as those children begin to sing in chorus there in that outer court, and the words of the songs begin to just echo off those stone walls. Jesus, uh, it's, it's amazing to me when children get together. And I remember as a child when we would sing together in that little Methodist church where I was raised. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. How that would ring out through the rafters of that old wooden church and across those wooden pews as we would sing to the top of our lungs like they told us to. But we truly knew from our Bible school teaching that Jesus loves the little children and we wanted to honor him like that. I see these children singing out in chorus that day. And Jesus looks at the religious critics. And he actually mocks them. Because this is what he says. They said, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Yes, I hear what they're saying. Why, you're a learned scholar. Have you never read I can see him in a mocking way back at the chief priest. Have you not read? Do you not know this book that you've studied? Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you, God, have perfected praise. The innocence of a child that comes to Jesus and sings the songs of honor and praise. The mystery of the temple. Someone says, I don't know why they sing like they say. I can tell you why we sing like we do. We can't help but praise our God. We can't help but worship him. Someone says, oh, I wish they'd get through those preliminaries down at the church so the preacher could preach and we'd go home. What preliminaries are you talking about? We're to be singing praise and honor and worship to our God. Those lyrics that have been written like John Newton wrote in Amazing Grace have been with us for centuries now. Written in 1774, I believe it was, I've read. 1737, I'm sorry. 17, and still today rings out through the rafters of the true church about God's amazing grace. Let us bring honor to our God in this temple that he dwells in. If Jesus truly is in your heart, hear me, if Jesus is truly in your heart, you will want to live holy and pleasing to him. If Jesus is truly in your heart, you know that he is the great healer. You can go to him in times of need and grief and find peace with him because he is faithful to you. 
If Jesus is truly in your heart, then like the Apostle Paul, you sing psalms and spiritual songs like we heard this morning and hymns. And you reverberate those words to God that have been written by spirit-led men and women to pronounce the honor and praise of Almighty God. The intolerance of the re religious. The scripture says, he left them. God, don't ever leave me. He left them. He left them and rejected them. But he lodged with those who had accepted him. The scripture says, he left them and went out to the city of Bethany and he lodged there. I can tell you where he lodged in the city of Bethany. At Lazarus' house. That's where he was. Among those that accepted him. And he takes up residence in your temple and my temple when we truly freely accept him that's the mystery 